Welcome to The Pictures Get Smaller. My name is Adam O'Connor and I'm the producer of this show. The things you will hear over the next hour represent the views of The Pictures Get Smaller and the people making them. All opinions and quotations in no way represent River West Radio and are the sole responsibility of the producer, guests, and callers. River West Radio is not liable for any legal issues arising from the content of this program. So, good evening and once again, and welcome to episode 18 of The Pictures Get Smaller. I'm Adam O'Connorkey, and I'm joined by Paul Gagliardi, Ron Felton, and a FedEx truck hovering in the background, <laughs> as you might hear. Tonight, our topic is the recently released Django Unchained, the newest film by Quentin Tarantino. In addition to discussing our reactions to the film, we'll be delving into Tarantino's career as a whole and the recurring controversy that he provokes due to his film's violent content, casual use of racial slurs, and hyper-referentiality to other films, among other things including the director's own obnoxious public personality. <laughs> so, uh, Ron, Paul, and I had to say that at least once tonight. Um, <laughs> you, get, you get one, and that was... That was the it. one. That was, that was the one, yeah. yes. So, Paul, Ron, <laughs> when preparing for this episode, it seemed as if we had agreed... Uh, we all agree that we had a great deal of ambivalence about Tarantino in general, uh, although I could probably recite large portions of Pulp Fiction from memory. Mm -hmm. uh, so what makes us so hesitant to embrace Tarantino, whose films, you know, I have to say I always enjoy, but I sometimes have trouble loving or admitting maybe the brilliance of. Maybe we could just start with Django Unchained. <laughs> Since that one, well, I don't know. Ron, you've seen the most favorable, or the most positive reaction of all of us, and for me, I thought it might have been his weakest film, which we can get into a bit. So, yeah, and one of the things we started to talk about before we went on air here was uh, the fact that I'd taken such a long break from his work. Um, he kind of lost me with the Kill Bill series, even though, as I mentioned, it was something kind of on paper that I should have liked, I didn't. Uh, so I just kind of checked out for a while. Uh, I didn't see Inglorious Bastards until last night. Yeah. So, I mean, there was, mm -hmm. uh, what, five or six years there where I really wasn't watching anything of his. Right. Except maybe rewatching Jackie Brown a few times. Um, and did you see uh, Death Proof from the Grindhouse? Yeah, set? actually, I guess I did. I'd kind of forgotten about that. Yeah. Uh, I didn't like it at all. <laughs> which <laughs> Did you see it on its own or as part of Grindhouse? I, I think saw that it, makes a difference. Yeah, I saw it in the theater as part of Grindhouse. Okay. And um, I liked it. More than I like Planet Terror, I guess. Sure. Right, which was the other one. The, uh, But anyway, just having taken such a long break from him, I think I came to Django uh, with fresh eyes in a way. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think I was suffering some of the burnout maybe that a lot of people have, or especially people whose job it is to watch everything <laughs> and then com <laughs> you know, comment on it. Sure. You know, I, we have the luxury of just watching what we want when we want yeah. and I think I think maybe that had something to do I mean I do think it was a great film Django and Chain. yeah right and uh, I'm not sure if I would feel differently about it if I hadn't taken that break but I think at least in part that accounts for mm. maybe some of my feelings about it mm. before um, before we get into Django Unchained I, I wanted to ask about your own sort of personal preferences with films like you you're a big fan of exploitation cinema yeah. i know and so is tarantino right. and many of his films sort of play on that fandom and sort mm -hmm. of reproduce it from jackie brown sort of starring this black exploitation star mm -hmm. and having other elements uh, the same with like death proof being a tribute to the low budget like b or c horror movies um mm -hmm. and even django unchained is like a western but also filtered through all these other sort of exploitation um, elements for you with Tarantino is it do you find that his use of exploitation elements is effective or is it come off as sort of I don't know appropriating these these forms that you don't think should be done in, in a mainstream film and he is essentially a mainstream filmmaker I mean don't yeah I agree uh, yeah I mean I I have a hard time with like should shouldn't questions you know obviously yeah. he can do whatever he wants and i i tend to actually like that about his films because i can see them as kind of rooted in or inspired by this certain i guess what is now looked at as a kind of tradition yeah and i think one of my kind of uh problems with his work was that i never saw 
his films really, uh, I guess, I mean, he does his own thing with them, obviously, but I always just kind of liked the source material better than I liked what he was doing in response to it. Yeah. And so it's just like, well, why am I watching this? Or what am I getting from this that I'm not getting from these films that he's supposedly inspired by? Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, I agree with that because I, I'm not as into the exploitation cinema, but I have an appreciation for um, you know, various films from that very loose genre. And I, I think with me, I was thinking about Adam's initial question. After Pulp Fiction, I remember seeing Pulp Fiction not long after it premiered and thinking yeah. it was just really cool and really interesting. Yeah, yeah. And then I think the persona of Tarantino aggravated me for years <laughs> and yeah. then i i think i, I kind of came to a place where I, I thought of his films more as just like a a blank parody mm -hmm. of you know sex exploitation black exploitation mm -hmm. um you know the pam greer films of, of the 60s 60s uh, 70s. Se 70s um and then when i saw inglorious bastards a couple of years ago i actually kind of felt a little invigorated yeah, for right for him as a filmmaker. Yeah. And it I felt like something new. That's yeah. And that's what I had seen Django and Chain because I hadn't seen Inglorious mm -hmm. Bastards. And, you know, watching those two, um, <laughs> more or less one after the other. I saw yeah. Django and Chain only a mm -hmm. couple weeks ago and then seeing Inglorious Bastards. Like those two films, even though the subject matter is very different, mm -hmm. the way it deals with the subject matter in each mm -hmm. film is kind of similar. Yeah. Um, not so much you know with not so much regard for historical accuracy these types of yeah. things that he's been criticized for um you know i think there are a lot of similarities in the way that he went about making those films or dealing with the subject matter um that allows me anyway as a viewer to kind of put those two in a group together uh, more or less apart from his earlier films mm -hmm. um but anyway yeah i think you know not having seen Glorious Bastards, or not until yesterday anyway, I had the experience, I think, that you're describing, Paul, when I saw Django Unchained. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it yeah. seemed like something new and, you know, I, I don't know, for lack of a better word, fresh, at yeah. least in terms of what he had done before. You know, those films right. were so, like, self-referential, you know, and they were in this Tarantino world with the same kind of, like, types of people, you know, Reservoir Dogs, Default Fiction. It's not really that And they're L.A. films, stretch. too. Right. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and these were just, you know, historical pieces set in not only different places but different alternate times. histories yeah, yeah alternate yeah. histories and they yeah. were just a little more fun in that mm -hmm. way I yeah thought. Mm -hmm. see having seen you know glorious bastards in the theater i i felt like Django Unchained was of a kind with it but also a kind of inferior version of it like i felt mm -hmm. like i'd already seen that kind of mm -hmm. narrative and some of the tricks that he was doing like the anachronistic soundtrack um mm -hmm. you know all sorts of things um and certainly there's like elements of Django and Jane that are new, which maybe we can get to in a minute, but it, it felt like a, a rehash and, and kind of a, a little bit of an unpolished one as well. Um, mm -hmm. Like uh, the critic Jim Emerson, who has a blog that's attached to Robert Ebert's website. Mm -hmm. I usually like his take on films. He, he tends to just survey lots of opinions and sort of sort it out. And he was talking about enjoying elements of Django and Jane and certainly it's a uh, Christoph Waltz, right? Not Christopher, or yeah, is it Christoph, Christoph Waltz? Yeah. Christoph, yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, he, he is just a delight. I oh, feel like yeah. in both of those yeah. two films. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but then other elements, like like Emerson was pointing out, that it feels like rough. Like things don't quite seem as sharp. They're like uh, the editing, and maybe it's because his long ed turned to his longtime editor recently passed away. Mm -hmm. um, maybe that had some I effect on the final product of the film, or at least the product that made it theater. Supposedly, Tarantino says there's already like a longer director's cut that that's coming out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there's, I think, a comic book adaptation of the film as well that mm -hmm. that indulges in his full script. So um, perhaps making it longer would make it seem, I don't know, more substantive to me. But I, I don't know. It's already a long film as it is. Yeah, and that, you know, and that's one of the things a lot of people have criticized about is they felt it was very kind of masturbatory and bloated and. You know, and that's actually, I expected to feel that way going mm -hmm. into it. I saw, yeah. okay, here, you know, again, I hadn't seen Inglorious Bastards, which is also two and a half hours long. Yeah. Um, and I hadn't seen that at the time. So going into the theater to see Django, I thought, oh, Tarantino with two and a half hours to kill, this is going to be <laughs> terrible. Like, I was yeah. I was already preparing to kind of 
write this terrible re- I mean I don't write reviews anyway but I was like I was ready to you mm-hmm. know <laughs> but then I'm watching it um, and I'm thinking just scene by scene I'm like I'm glad that was here I, I wouldn't want that to be cut yeah. you yeah. know I don't and I don't know that every single scene or you know every aspect of every scene really that they were essential or that they served the narrative yeah. you know in a perfectly supporting kind of way but mm-hmm. As a viewer, I'm glad they were all there, especially, you know, once I got to the end of the film, I was thinking back, I'm like, I wouldn't have cut any of that stuff, Hmm. you know? And it's interesting, I think, that some people criticize it for that reason, that it is too long, and that you're saying, in some ways, you feel like it would almost benefit from being longer. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I I feel like the end of the film, it was supposed to be this really cathartic moment, Mm -hmm. and, like, after a certain point, it just felt like things were being rushed and kind of going through the motions in some weird way. Like, mm. oh, of course, here's, this is going to... Like, you can kind of see, like, the progress of the narrative. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I Like, the last... Extending it, yeah. like, s- like lengthening the pace, like, sh- or, you know, stretching out the pace so it wasn't so quick, mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. would make what the, you know, the intended emotional beats hit a little harder at the end of the film, at least. Mm-hmm. I thought earlier on it was a little bit better, um, particularly the scene where uh waltz and uh jamie fox are like being held up by the whole town basically mm-hmm. <laughs> because yeah. they killed the right, sheriff right, or something. right yeah that was a great scene of like tension and then in comet comedy blended but mm-hmm. uh but much of the, the rest of the film just went too quick even mm-hmm. though it's such a long mm-hmm. film yeah <laughs> mm-hmm. it's a strange thing but I, I felt like when christopher Chris, waltz's character died i kind of lost interest in the film mm. yeah. after that point because it became I guess what I, yeah, I saw it like a few days after Newton, you know, because that was uh, the Newtown, sh- oh, yeah, yeah, Newtown yeah. shooting. And so I was uh, kind of sensitive to, to, I don't know why I went to see it now that I think about it. <laughs> yeah. But I was very event- sensitive. And I, I knew once that happened, like the, the cacophony of, cacophony yeah. of violence would break out. And, yeah. you know, then I was like, eh, I don't know if I'm really invested in this. Right. Yeah, anymore. I agree because even though I think Django is supposed to be the protagonist, if you have to pick you yeah. Know, one, yeah. I really felt like this was a kind of a buddy film. Right. You know, right like right, those right. two mm-hmm. were a team and they needed each other. And when Waltz's character died, I had a similar feeling. Yeah. yeah. It's not that I didn't like Jamie Foxx's character no. or that no, I no, wasn't no. Yeah. like rooting for him, but I just felt like, okay, this is a team. And, you know, and I guess in a way it kind of serves the narrative. Okay, Waltz is dead. Mm-hmm. Uh, Django is going to go on. He's got, yeah. you know, uh, his wife back. And that's maybe going to be the new team going forward, those two. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe that's what we're supposed to get from it in part is that, you know, Waltz has kind of passed on these mm-hmm. skills yeah. or something to Django and that Django doesn't need Waltz anymore. But I just felt like as a viewer, I, I definitely did kind of, I didn't lose interest. I don't know how to put it exactly. Yeah. But once Waltz's character died, I was kind of like, oh, mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. wish he hadn't died. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah. Right. I feel in, in some of the reviews I've read that the ones that sort of take the film on its own terms without delving into sort of the broader issues that the film is addressing, uh, we're talking about Jamie Foxx's character, Django, as, as being one that just isn't that complex, mm-hmm. right? Um, you know, Waltz mm-hmm. sort of purchases slash steals the character earlier in the film. Then they form a team, and he's just sort of single-minded in his quest to find his his wife, mm-hmm. right? And so it's a very, like, linear character arc. <laughs> yeah. Has a goal, achieves goal, film is over. And there's, like, you know, detours where Waltz's characters, the motives are a little bit fuzzier sometimes. Um, and perhaps that's a problematic element. I mean, you know, certain reactions of the film have accused him, Tarantino, of, you know, sort of indulging in racism, even as he's ostensibly, you know, tearing apart and, and parroting, like, the institution of slavery and those who upheld it for so long. Mm-hmm. Yet his, his African-American characters are seem a bit more one-dimensional than, than the Caucasian counterparts. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe... I think that's fair to an extent. Uh, I don't know if I'd go so far as to say that you know, Tarantino's being a racist in any way, yeah. right? Maybe and I wasn't necessarily saying No, that. I know you weren't. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely know you weren't. Um, but I just think, you know, I don't know. I, I didn't necessarily have that impression in seeing the film. I, 
the, the racist element of the it, yeah. you know, the African American characters maybe not being as complex or developed, mm -hmm. um, but maybe you know I guess to play devil's advocate that could be in some ways um, Tarantino saying well and I think this is how I also respond to some of the criticism about his use of uh, the N word yeah. right like that's what those characters would say mm -hmm. right, right. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean. Look at the context there. That's what the characters would say. And, I mean, there are other reasons or other ways people have car or criticized him for using language like that. Mm -hmm. um, but again, you know, looking at, okay, well, we have a, a now recently former slave, mm -hmm. right, who has more or less his freedom. He's teamed up with Waltz. What would he want, right? He would be kind of, he would have this tunnel vision, yeah. right? Yeah. He would mm -hmm. just want to get his wife back. He's not interested in, you know, going on these tangents and sure. taking these adventures that aren't necessary, he would have that kind of singular focus. Um, and I don't know, maybe Tarantino mm. could have communicated that better, or mm -hmm. maybe that's not even what he meant to do. But, you know, what choice or, you know, what choice would those characters have in that mm. context? Right. I don't know. I, I, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes it total does. sense. Because yeah. I, I, I was thinking about some of the criticism and, and reading you know, Spike Lee's you know, yeah. yeah, I'm not going to watch it. Criticism and, <laughs> but actually, I, I, yeah, I mean, for the character, what else would be his his motivation? I mean, that would be the driving mm -hmm. motive of the character is to get his wife back into, you know, in some ways, seek revenge yeah. against you know the, and that's why I think some of the most visceral scenes you see are against. Uh, other slaves so mm -hmm. it kind of reinforces that yeah, there must right. be a bloodletting like when his wife is in the hot box yeah mm -hmm. you know that's um pretty uncomfortable to watch and you know it's very clear that jimmy fox is or django is seeing that mm -hmm. and you know what else what else would you need necessarily as a character right. yeah you know? whereas Walt's character <clears throat> doesn't have something like that at stake right he, yeah. right he can afford as a character to just be a little more interesting yeah. mm -hmm. right and not necessarily be so kind of single-minded or sure. he has the, uh, the agency to yeah absolutely to have different motives in some ways the privilege of being sort of flippant about things right, yeah. right. to yeah. indulge whims and, right. and which comes across to a viewer as an interesting you know coming right. across as mm -hmm. interesting right. yeah yeah and i guess uh even that single-mindedness of of django i would and again maybe you would can confirm this or not, but it seems to fit the exploitation genre in terms of narratives. There's a single goal, oftentimes, that's right. sought um, and fought for over the course of a film. Yeah, I mean, those films are not highly intellectualized in the sense that these characters are really developed and given, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, complex motives. I think, like you were saying in an email earlier today, Adam, you know, I, well, you were saying it with regard to Tarantino as being kind of moralistic, right? And oh, a lot yeah. of his characters, mm -hmm. even if maybe ostensibly they're they have they're good people, but they have some bad qualities, we still know they're the good guy, and that's yeah. who we need to root yeah. for mm -hmm. as an audience. I mean, that that definitely is a product I think of m many exploitation films, and in particular the ones that Tarantino claims to be inspired by right where these aren't really rich characters that are developed and you know complex kind of emotionally it's like oh this terrible thing happened to me and now i've got to do something about yeah. it right right yeah before uh, maybe moving into that issue of tarantino tarantino's moralism uh to uh to sort of put a cap on this this bit about the reaction to the film uh I have the quotes from, from Spike Lee. <laughs> his, his initial tweet uh, was saying that American slavery is not a Sergio Leone spaghetti western. It was a holocaust. My ancestors are slaves stolen from Africa. I will honor them. And then Lee elaborated in an interview that he can't uh, talk about the film because he's not going to see it. I'm not seeing it. All I'm going to say is that it's disrespectful to my ancestors to see that film. Uh, and earlier, Spike Lee has sort of criticized um, Tarantino throughout his career for, I mean... Sure, there's perhaps an excessiveness to the racial epithets in um, Django Unchained, but there's nothing new to Tarantino. It, it sort of permeates his catalog, mm -hmm. is you know the use of the N-word. And mm -hmm. apparently Spike Lee once said, uh, when Jackie Brown came out, Tarantino's third film, uh, what does Tarantino want to be made an honorary black man? <laughs> mm -hmm. And so again, I wonder with 
the intentions? Is it Tarantino? And again, intentionality is always sort of speculative, I guess, unless we have direct quotes, and even then that can be misleading. But uh, is Tarantino using these terms, um, these slurs, in just a glib, flippant way? Is he reproducing them because they're found in the films that he loves and is trying to remake? Or is he actually sort of surreptitiously racist by claiming to be above racism he's actually kind of reproducing it in some way or another well i don't know i mean if you look at a film like jackie brown for example the pam greer Greer character in there jackie brown Mm -hmm. right i really don't i can't imagine a fair reading of that film that would argue that tarantino as the director of that even though he didn't necessarily write it right that was based on what elmore Elmore leonard Mm -hmm. (coughs) Although I don't know to what extent, if it was just the general, um, you know, narrative and right. turns, you know, like swapped in characters or what. Like but I, I just can't imagine a fair reading of that film that would argue that Tarantino as the director was somehow racist, right? I mean, right. okay, maybe the language there makes some people uncomfortable, but look at that character, right? And like what she goes through, what she does. Yeah, um, so by far the smartest character yeah, in the film. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. I mean... <coughs> I don't know. I understand that the language makes people uncomfortable, but I think, too, yeah. looking at the context is obviously important, realizing yeah. that this is a fictional universe that he's created. Yeah. You know, I think of what you said about maybe this language being inspired by some of the films that he's drawing from is absolutely true. Um, I don't know. I don't mm-hmm. know really how else to respond. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't necessarily... I, I can't see how... I mean, what about, say, the infamous... Sorry, Paul. Go no, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead and ask. ask. I wasn't really going anywhere with Oh, that, okay. So, yeah, it's fine. I mean, I think, like, an infamous scene is perhaps when Tarantino himself appears in Pulp Fiction and they're, like, he and John Fulton and Samuel L. Jackson's character are trying to dispose of this dead body. Right. And it's just littered with, with uses of the N-word, like, to a really excessive degree. And it's literally coming out of his mouth as well, which mm-hmm. is, like... Why did he cast himself in this role? Why, I mean, would it ring differently if it was played by just an anonymous actor or mm-hmm. an African American actor or, you know, all these other possibilities? Um, I mean, that seems mm-hmm. to be some of the things that like Spike Lee is and others are responding to. Tarantino puts himself up front with using this sort of language in his films. Mm-hmm. I think it goes mm-hmm. back to this idea of what would this character say, right? Yeah. Like. Who knows? I mean, we, I, I don't know. I think to some extent this gets back to a really basic discussion of what is fiction, you know. Sure. But, uh, mm-hmm. You know, I mean, like Tarantino's character in Pulp Fiction, we don't know that much about him. It's a minor yeah. character, right? We He's don't shown to have a uh, black wife, I guess, right? Yeah. If I, I d- don't know if that's uh, supposed to undercut the racism or not. Yeah. It's a fantasy about Bonnie coming home and, and she appears briefly on screen. So, I mean, you know, who knows? What, as the creator or director of the film, I feel like he's got some license or liberty there to imagine who these characters are and what they might say. Yeah. Um, and I, I just I, I feel like a criticism based on language is really superficial or minor compared to what characters actually do. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that like, makes sense. Especially, you know, we were talking about Jackie Brown, right? That character, I think... He obviously adores that character, is trying mm-hmm. to at least portray her positively. Yes. So yeah, we've got some language there that some people object to, but I mean, I, I feel like you're kind of a view of a view like that kind of misses the forest for the trees. Mm-hmm. Sure, that yeah. makes sense. No, I, I, yeah, I, I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe easy. we can use that as an opportunity to get into some of his other filmography aside from um, Django Unchained. Uh, you know, I actually I just rewatched Jackie Brown last night. Mm-hmm. Um, the first time I'd rewatched it in its entirety mm. since it was in the theaters, um, God, maybe 15 years ago or something. Uh, and I, I was really wrapped into it, and I found it, in some ways, maybe the most mature of Tarantino's films. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, mm-hmm. uh, mature just in terms of like the storytelling technique and just the polish of the filmmaking craft. And I, I'm, I'm uncertain again to what extent like it's adapted from the Elmore Leonard novel. If it's a straight up adaptation, um, if it's just general, general elements of the plot, but uh, there's some like focus to that film where he really 
you know, gets into his genre play. Uh, but then there's all sorts of other great elements. There's wonderful sound design. There's really striking um, compositions at times. Uh, some nice use of long takes that don't just seem gimmicky, as I feel like they sometimes do in uh, in some of his films. Like there's a shot in Death Proof where he just circles around a table of women talking. Mm-hmm. And it's it's cool, but it's yeah. also sort of purposeless where we see there's like two like long t- semi-long takes back-to-back in Jackie Brown that that work in a much more interesting fashion, uh, I think, to get into this subjective uh, sense of Jackie Brown's thoughts at the time. <laughs> yeah, I, I felt like that was uh, the first film of his where the narrative became more important than, you know, the clever dialogue yeah. or these just kind of, mm. uh, I don't know, you know, these types of shots you're describing where it's purely for effect kind of in the moment. Yeah, you know, where it seemed like he had taken a step back a little bit as a filmmaker and said, "What's the bigger picture here? Yeah. Let's work more to create a mood that not only serves a particular scene, but then contextualizes what came before it, what comes after it." Sure. And I just felt like, as a kind of coherent whole, it worked better yeah. than than his earlier work and even a lot of stuff he's done since then. So it, it's still, yeah. to me, you know, it's still my favorite of his. And he still films. gets his pet interest snuck yeah, in, right? Absolutely. This like fetishization of '70s culture, <laughs> um, sure. the wonderful soundtracks, the uh, disjointed time that some of his films had. Like, mm-hmm. I guess not as much in the last film or two. It's mm-hmm. there's not as much jumping around, or there are clear flashbacks if it does jump around. And um, that is my favorite Michael Keaton role. <laughs> yeah, he hasn't really had many good roles since then, actually. <laughs> Um, no. Yeah, Michael mm. Keaton's pretty great in this one. Yeah. I mean, everyone is. Yeah. Robert Forster yeah, is. Yeah, Robert Forster is amazing. Delight. I think. Yeah. Uh, De Niro is in it too. Isn't he? he is, yeah. and he's he's also one of his last charming roles, I would say. He plays yeah. a delightfully kind of dumb, mm-hmm. like blunt uh, mm-hmm. guy who just blunders through life. Yeah. Was was Jackie Brown ni- like 1997 or 1998? Yeah, I, I, w- the dates I, right? I think yeah. it's 97. I haven't checked or looked it up but mm. that's what's coming it's to around mind. there yeah. Mm. yeah i don't think it's later than 98 but okay um yeah but yeah i, ha- so I haven't, you I haven't you seen, seen it, seen it since a long time since, Paul. Um, since not soon after it was released or i yeah. remember seeing on at on home video and um my only reference point was pulp fiction because i hadn't seen um yeah. Reservoir Dogs. Reservoir Dogs at that point. Right. And I did feel it was sort of much tighter as as a narrative. Yeah. Whereas, yeah, I guess I was, you know, when I saw Pulp Fiction, I was like, oh, it starts in the middle. <laughs> and it was like such, for like my 16-year-old bo- you know, mind, it was like yeah. the coolest thing yeah. ever. And then I think the acting was much s- stronger as yeah. in my, my very foggy memory of the, the yeah. film. A little bit more subtle. Yeah, well, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. I think it was it was more subtle, which maybe speaks to his maturity as a filmmaker. Mm-hmm. And, you know, back to some of the points I was trying to make about it being a better narrative or it, it having more of a focus on narrative and, mm-hmm. and actual character development as yeah. opposed to just kind of cartooning yeah. people running around and shooting mm-hmm. each other and swearing a lot, <laughs> which yeah. is fine. That's fine, too. But It is, yeah. Yeah. You know. <laughs> It was markedly different in those ways, I think. Yeah. So, um, sorry, we keep moving out of your reference points, Paul. Maybe no, that's fine. Pulp Fiction. Should we head there next? Since, sure. Um, yeah, that one is a film I've watched so many times. <laughs> I like falling asleep to it or something. Yeah. So, like half the film is just memorized, I would say. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, that's something that when I rewatch it, I still enjoy it. But it, I had a weird sort of. Again, like striking ambivalence about the film the last time that I that I caught it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, what are you, what are your two thoughts on on Pulp Fiction? I, know, I think I've seen it so often that it loses any surprise for me. Yeah. You know, it's you know the first couple of times you watch it, there is that strong element of surprise, and it's not that I'm comparing films, but if I watch Citizen Kane again, I do discover something <laughs> different in Citizen Kane each time I watch it, which isn't you know. But Pulp Fiction, it's sort of like I know the beats. And yeah. I know the, um, so it's not fresh sure. anymore for me. And I think I already said, like, f- when I first saw it, it was revelatory. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But 
mean, I think some of the things that might have seemed shocking are now. I mean, that film had such an impact that they've just now you get like a Thirty Rock episode where there's like a gimp character mm-hmm. marrying two people. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. things that when you first see Pulp Fiction, maybe it right your teens or whatever. Right, it seems. Or an episode of the episode yeah. Community where it's the Pulp Fiction parody, then it turns yeah. into my dinner, my dinner with Andre. Andre. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then also having you know. Since first seeing that film when I was younger, caught up on other things that it's referencing, like, I don't know, Godard's Band of Outsiders or mm-hmm. something mm-hmm. Um, that Tarantino named his production company after. But, um, uh, you know, characters just randomly dance. Right. Like, we take a break to dance in the middle of the film. Mm-hmm. Um, it seems super cool and weird without having the reference point. And now it seems like, oh, that's a nice illusion. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's still some charm to it. And there's also that added layer of Travolta referencing his earlier career as a sort of dancing icon. Right, um, right. Which is kind of fun. But uh, mm. but it's just like reference upon reference upon reference. In that I film. think it's also kind of as a bridge to last week's episode where you mentioned Wild Hogs. I think I've seen so many horrible <laughs> Travolta movies since then that I can no longer look at that character with any sort of open-mindedness. Yeah. I'm like, no, no. I saw you ride your Harley into. You know, it just <laughs> you played an takes angel me after out this. of the. Yeah, which is interesting because I was thinking about some of the reasons I might like Django Unchained, and now that I've seen it, and Glorious Bastards, enough that I'm kind of, like I said before we started, maybe just on the positive side of ambivalent now, whereas before I was at best ambivalent about mm-hmm. Tarantino. Yeah. And I feel like with these last two films, and I don't know, I mean, I don't know what his process is like for casting and why in Pulp Fiction, for example, we had to have John Travolta, who even, you know, at that point had arguably like a dead career. Well, you know? I think yeah. that, that was precisely it. I seem to remember Tarantino saying, he remembered Travolta being cool and he wanted to restore that sense of coolness to yeah. him. Something along those lines. Yeah, and I just yeah. feel like, you know, obviously I'm not a filmmaker, but I feel like that's not how I would go about casting. No. Right? Like, no. Who, like, that just seems like this nostalgic kind of mm-hmm. uh, donation, or I don't know, mm-hmm. that's not the right word, that's not the word I'm looking for, but I feel like with these last few films, they're just much better cast, right? Yeah. We, we're talking about like Christoph Waltz. Who yeah. I think at the time of Inglorious Bastards, I mean, he definitely didn't have anything major in the United States, right. right? He might have done some like supporting role or something that I'm not familiar with, but like he found somebody who I think is probably one of the greatest actors to appear in any of his films, and he's used him twice now. Yes. Yeah. And it yeah. seemed like that was a much smarter decision. Go with somebody who clearly mm-hmm. has this yeah. talent and serves this character, right? He's, you know, he can yeah. a polyglot who. Yeah, for both roles, that's convenient. And uh, Emerson was saying precisely the same thing about Waltz. Like, he's the perfect Tarantino actor because you can get away with saying the sort of overwritten dialogue mm-hmm. that Tarantino has. Like, like Emerson was pointing out, saying "ascertain." Like, I've ascertained. Like, mm-hmm. right, right. Coming out of Waltz's mouth, it's sort of charming and delightful. And, yes. And from a, a lesser actor, it just seems like stilted dialogue. Like if you had cast Travolta <laughs> as <laughs> as yep. Schultz, you know, yeah, yeah. it just. Which is maybe something he would have done 15 years ago. Yeah. But yeah. I, don't, I don't think hmm. he's maybe as driven by that now. Huh. I think it's a great point because I was, yeah, I think in each of his films that I've seen, there's there's obviously like a stunt casting that I think with, with Pulp Fiction, sort of Travolta actually pulls it off, you know, as in acting in, in terms of performance. But I didn't, and there's still moments in Django, Django Unchained and then, I forget there was some actor in Inglorious Bastards that was is it a very minor role and I Sam Levine well, there are lots Maybe. I mean Michael Myers had a small right part. ah that's it Mike yeah. Lord, I'm like what what are you no yeah. please don't but it's not it's only like a few lines right. and it's, yeah and then he went away <laughs> and they went away um who was it in uh, uh, uh Don Johnson oh right in Django right. Unchained and uh, we talked about Tom Wopat <laughs> plays the other sheriff yeah you know, from the Dukes of Hazard but um, there's supposed to be even more like I think Kevin Costner was originally slated to be in it or asked to be in it. Yeah, and then uh, there were a lot of people that, that pulled out. Yeah. I know, um, Kurt Russell, I think, Kurt as Russell well. and um, Borat. Oh, uh, Sasha. Sasha Baron Sasha Cohen. Baron Cohen, yeah. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, because I, I kind of got that feeling when I saw Don Johnson on the screen. I kind of mm. thought, like, oh, here we go again. Yeah. But then I remembered, you know, that he's actually 
been in that eastbound and down for yes. example like yeah. he's been doing interesting things yeah. or at least that one interesting mm-hmm. thing sure. that i know yeah. of mm-hmm. lately so for me it wasn't quite the same as pulling like john travolta <laughs> out of <laughs> right you know yeah. right what became i guess yeah. relative obscurity unless mm-hmm. you watch tv land <laughs> <laughs> you know since we're on the topic i mean one one of those maybe stunt castings and, and no pun intended like was you know kurt russell as the stuntman driver mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. death proof yeah and uh, I mean, I think that worked really well, and maybe it's just because I've been watching a bunch of John Carpenter movies lately, but I, I really miss, like, having <laughs> Kurt Russell in that that goofy sort of... I mean, he's not really a hero in that movie. Obviously, he's the villain, but right. um, in these, like, goofy, charismatic, like, lead performances... Um, Snake Plissken. Exactly, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and that really didn't seem to... Well, maybe because Grindhouse didn't do well, but I haven't heard much from Kurt Russell before or since then, really. Unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I don't know. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, thinking just because it's uh, fresh in my mind and glorious bastards, you also had Harvey Keitel as the voice on the phone at one point. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. And right. Sam Jackson doing w- the little narration that there was. Mm-hmm. You know, Sam Jackson, obviously, is uh, mm-hmm. he's has to be the actor who's appeared in the most Tarantino films, right? It's probable. At least four. Right. Yeah, I mean, he was in, he was in Pulp, Pulp Fiction, Fiction and Jackie, Jackie Brown, Brown and Django Unchained. Django Unchained. Yeah. And oh, he's in the Kill Bill movies briefly. So, as a so at least five. Then. Yeah. 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 Six of you count them separately. Mm. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. But he's not struggling. <laughs> no, he's not. You know, we we hadn't really gotten into Kill Bill very much, um, which is. For some people, they're counting this, well, the last four films, if you count Kill Bill as two, um, the last four films as a revenge trilogy <laughs> of sorts. Mm-hmm. You can just ignore the muddled logic there. But, um, you know, and each sort of focusing on a group that's potentially been disenfranchised by patriarchy <laughs> to some extent mm-hmm. uh, and, and hate groups and all sorts of things. So we have a, a what? A woman, women revenge fantasy, a Jewish revenge fantasy, and an African American revenge fantasy, mm-hmm. um, all developed and concocted by this again white director. To come back to it, uh, which, if nothing else, it's it's notable. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure I have more to say about it at the moment, but uh, but the Kill Bill movies, you guys have been saying that you weren't as big of a fan of them. Like for you, Ron, they turned you off of of Tarantino and I'm just wondering why that is <laughs> yeah I, I you know I think um, on paper I sh- you know I expected to like them you know I tend to like kind of kung fu martial arts movies mm-hmm. um, I don't I don't necessarily look for uh, I'll watch anything let's put it that way you know I mean <laughs> not everything I watch has to be uh, Citizen Kane or something um, but I, I don't know it just didn't do anything for me I was just watching it and it's like these fight scenes were just while kind of beautifully shot and obviously well choreographed and all those things it just didn't do anything for me I just w- felt yeah. bored and disengaged and I I don't know I, I think I felt at the time and especially then Grindhouse Grindhouse was after that right? yes and then after I saw Grindhouse, I just thought, like, okay, I hated the last two things that he did, or three if you count the Kill Bill volume separately. And I just felt like that's it, you know. He's done. Mm-hmm. Kind of shot yeah. his wad, and that's going to be it. Um, but I don't know. I mean, it's been so long since I've seen the Kill Bill movies. I I saw them in the theater, and that was it. I haven't rewatched them since. I might have caught, like, a few minutes here or there mm-hmm. somewhere. But yeah. um, I don't know that I can really speak more specifically about what it was about them that I didn't like it just it was more of a kind of visceral like eh. that was you know that was really the extent mm-hmm. of it unfortunately yeah um, I don't know mm. I didn't see them and I, I didn't I still don't really have a desire to sit down and watch them mm-hmm. and I think it was just something about the premise or the I think I think I mentioned earlier, like kind of Tarantino fatigue. I was just 
I kind of could expect what was in there and I didn't really feel the need to invest mm -hmm. six hours in watching yeah. both films or one film. Um, yeah, and I think it, it's just like I, I prefer to watch an actual, you know, kung fu movie. Uh, than <laughs> yeah. having to watch an American director do like a tribute, a tribute, favorite, loving tribute like, to elements, yeah. another grindhouse sort of cinema that. Which I think goes back to something we were discussing earlier. For me, it doesn't have anything to do with the fact that he's, you know, not an Asian filmmaker doing that. Right. It's just that he's not doing anything better than the originals did. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah that's that's closer to my, my, my feeling too. It's not yeah. a, like I pick nationalities based right. on like oh oh he's from Minnesota he can't <laughs> he can't make a film. But yeah, it's sort of like a, a the original is much more interesting to me than the the adapt the pastiche. Elements. No. Yeah. Uh -huh. Makes sense. I I know. Like yeah, you know. Okay. Yes. I'm just, <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank you. <laughs> so I had that really s horrible yeah. feeling, like did I use the wrong word there? No, no, yeah. no. Yeah. But yet sometimes that that pastiche works, right? I mean, no, with Jackie yeah, yeah. Brown. So I'm. I guess <coughs> now what I'm curious about is, we seem to have our own personal favorites of Tarantino's, right? Mm -hmm. um, and ones that we are less fond of. <laughs> um, and he's doing very similar things in like every sort of film. So like, what is it that makes for you, like the ones that you enjoy, like success, what makes them successful versus the ones that aren't successful? Like, I, you know, I thought like, so I really quite enjoyed Death Proof, um, but, but you didn't like think it was very strong. And so mm -hmm. why does that sort of pastiche mode of Tarantino like work not as well as, as something like, uh, and Glorious Bastards, which for me was like a very disjointed film, for although it had some very sharp scenes, obviously. Yeah, I don't know. You know, and the film is literally disjointed. It's got those yeah. chapters, right? Okay, mm -hmm. chapter three, right? Whatever, and it's you kind of have these separate threads that toward the end of the movie come together. Yeah. Um, I, for me, it was more of an enjoyable, I guess, just viewing experience. And I felt like I was going somewhere as mm -hmm. a viewer, that mm -hmm. there was this kind of narrative that I was following. The characters were interesting to me, even if, you know, and I, don't, I might be alone, but I thought Brad Pitt was kind of terrible, actually, in Inglorious <laughs> Bastards. Um, I mean, I see why he's maybe likable to some people, but he, w he wasn't quite, I guess, what I expected going into it. Yeah. And I don't even know what exactly I was expecting, but I was just surprised that... Uh, I don't, he was a little too cartoony, whereas mm. I felt like a lot of the other characters, like, again, Christoph Waltz's character was mm. just so smart, and, you know, he yeah. was always kind of conniving, and he was one step ahead of everybody who yeah. was trying to fool him, mm -hmm. um, and I just felt like that was a really impressive character, not only the performance, the actual acting, but just as a character, the way he was developed and the way his dialogue was written. Mm -hmm. Like, he was really good, and I just felt like Brad Pitt's character was this kind of he was this hillbilly, you know, former yeah. moonshiner. Sure. I'm just out here to kill me some Nazis and just much more cartoony. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, I just liked the fact that I, I, I kind of knew I was going somewhere, but I had no idea where that was, especially since Tarantino has this kind of revisionist history element in it, right, where mm -hmm. Hitler's dying in a way in the film that he didn't yeah. die in real life. Mm -hmm. So, like, you really couldn't have known unless you had read about the film and its plot earlier, sure. which I hadn't. Mm -hmm. um, but you get the sense throughout the film that you're going somewhere, that all these characters and all these kind of uh, narrative threads are going to converge somewhere. And that was just, it was much more engaging to me as a viewer, whereas when I watch some of his films I really don't like, you know, like the Kill Bill series or something. Like, I just don't care. I don't care what happens to any of these people. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like, even in something like Pulp Fiction, which I think I, I like more than I don't, mm -hmm. it's, like, that seems disjointed to me because I felt it's all about, like, how do I make this scene really clever? Yeah. And, you know, yeah. I, mm -hmm. I want to have a lot of quotable lines in here. And it, it seemed... Uh, does that make sense? How I'm yeah. Yeah. No. Absolutely. You know, maybe in hindsight for me with Pulp Fiction, what what stands out as a, a negative quality is something I once liked, how, oh, there's all these, you know, coincidental crossing of paths. And and, and now it seems to me like it predicts those those convoluted, it's all connected sorts of dramas from 
like the late 90s and, and yeah. early aughts like mm-hmm. you know uh Babel or Syrian mm-hmm. or you know mm-hmm. traffic or whatever like mm-hmm. not that they're bad films but there's just something always a little bit like convoluted about mm-hmm. about the overlapping lives and the way characters yeah. intersect um mm-hmm. whereas in in Glorious Bastards it's very like goal oriented in some ways like mm-hmm. there's a reason for this convergence that's happening aside from mm-hmm. pure coincidence as there is in Django yeah um which is interesting because you know that was one of the things I said I liked about Jackie Brown too was that Tarantino seemed to take a step back and say, what's the bigger picture here? And then how do I put these pieces together in a way that kind of serves that bigger picture and makes the bigger picture more interesting? Yeah. Which is interesting to me personally because I don't necessarily consider myself somebody who is really obsessive about narrative and character development. Like I said, I'll watch anything. And <laughs> I, te- I tend mm-hmm. to el- like at least something about everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's interesting that I can't really articulate why I don't like the Tarantino films that mm-hmm. I don't mm-hmm. like. Sure. I don't know. I actually, I was, I was, as I was listening to you, I was thinking, yeah, that's part of the reason why, you know, because you become attached to his character in uh, Django Unchained with Waltz's character, I think that's why it's such a disappointment for me when he dies. Mm-hmm. If you haven't seen the film, sorry. <laughs> um, but it is that sort of, the, he is an interesting character, and um, or even when Leonardo DiCaprio's character is... He just he's just so viciously evil mm-hmm. yeah. um, and such a great kind of not that I'm not yeah but like as a character he's really interesting mm-hmm. yeah and then when he's gone then well what are you left with your bunch of the guys out with, with the shotguns in the in the yard and then it's Django yeah um yeah. And I think the same thing is true with, with Inglorious Bastards and Django is that they're moving toward a goal and you you you're not necessarily sure how it's going to um, how everything is going to come together, but I'm 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 in, enraptured with what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, and plus, too, I, I, I'm much more familiar with the conventions of war movies and the western mm-hmm. than I am with, you know, kung fu movies. And True. to me, yeah. uh, it's also the subject matter. Yeah. And I think, no offense, but like I think World War II and and slavery lend themselves to much more interesting mm-hmm. critiques of the human condition mm-hmm. than than anything else or examinations of the human condition to make it yeah. highfalutinly intellectual yeah <laughs> <laughs> no, it's sorry it totally makes sense <laughs> I'm glad it did <laughs> you know for me I, I think I you know liked but didn't sort of overly embrace Django Unchained because of maybe a general criticism I have of Tarantino's films um, and characters with some exceptions maybe here and there uh you know him just being to me like a clearly like moralistic director um mm-hmm. in a very if you want to say like old testament sense like people do bad things and they get punished and that's pretty consistent throughout um mm-hmm. but in saying glorious bastards uh waltz's character is really interesting because he's done these horrific horrible things like countless times mm-hmm. and yet he's like audiences you like him in right. a weird way whereas the bad guys, quote unquote, bad guys in Django Unchained, are maybe comic characters, but there's nothing at all like sympathetic or interesting yeah. about them. And particularly like Leonardo DiCaprio's plantation, like his his sister, who there's an illusion of an incestuous relationship. Sure. It's just some like mm-hmm. like grotesque like space cadet character. Like I feel like the lines, and maybe it's Tarantino because he's dealing with such a like. Um, Initially, it elicited so many emotional responses in the United States. Like, maybe he felt like he couldn't get away with making some of these characters more complex. Like, mm. at least the villains, mm. um, where the villains in all the other films, kind of are in weird ways. Um, right? Can you imagine the backlash there would have been? Yeah. Right. If uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's yeah. character was in the least bit sympathetic. Right. Right. Because he's getting hammered just for using what the N word. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, it's more than that, but you know, mm-hmm. right. can you imagine if that yeah. character had yeah. been, it, he can't be witty and smart like Waltz in *Inglorious bastards. So he's shown to be like exceedingly stupid and arrogant, right? Like he claims to be a Francophile, but doesn't speak French. French. Right. Like yeah. Yeah. there's all sorts of like pretensions and like ways that, mm-hmm. to undercut his arrogance throughout the film. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think, you know, I'm just thinking about, your comment uh, regarding Tarantino's kind of Old Testament morality, <laughs> you know, I think I think that's that's a valid 
I don't know if it is a criticism exactly, but it's a it's, it's an a valid observation. Com- it's a valid yeah comment or observation. I I feel like he does kind of, and I don't know why he does it in this way, but I do see him kind of interjecting these really subtle kind of complications of that. Yeah. You know, toward the end of Inglorious Bastards, where Chris, Christoph Waltz's character is kind of negotiating um, with Brad Pitt, and then Brad Pitt's general, right? He's saying, yeah. "Okay, I'll." not stop your plan from happening so I'll allow Hitler and uh, Goebbels and all Mm. these other guys to die if you do this, this, and this. One of his demands is that he's um, presented to the Americans as this double agent who allowed the Nazis to do certain things for kind of the greater good, Mm -hmm. right? Like it was necessary that we allow the Nazis to get away with, you know, X, Y, and Z for this, which does you know, maybe kind of superficially or in a not-so-sophisticated way raise questions of, you know, um, I don't know, that we all struggle with when we think of things like war, you know, mm-hmm. like right. how many lives are we willing to um, spend or allow to be taken for this, you know, quote-unquote greater good or something. And even in Django, when uh, Django and Waltz's character are having that discussion about the difference between slavery and bounty hunting, right? right? They both deal in bodies. Mm-hmm. The only difference is that in slavery, the bodies are still living. Right. And, you know, they're, so he introduces those things and does try to complicate the characters uh, and make the good people maybe in some way appear a little less good. Yeah. But I think, you know, again, what you were saying is a perfectly valid observation that by and large, we know who the good guys are and who we're supposed to be rooting mm-hmm. for. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Well, we're about out of time. Any any last comments or, or thoughts on Tarantino? Mm-hmm. Recommendations? <laughs> I mean, I think well, we didn't mention True Romance at all. That's true. Which he didn't direct, but wrote the screenplay for. Him. Yeah, we barely touched on Reservoir Dogs, I suppose. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't know if we have time to really delve into them. Did any, did any quick, like, thoughts on <laughs> true romance that you wanted to get out <laughs> no it's been a long time since i've seen that uh but i remember liking it a lot at the time and i remember thinking that maybe i liked it because he didn't direct it mm-hmm. yeah you know like what would somebody else do with characters and things that he's created and it, it just it was an interesting kind of perspective or mm-hmm. a way to look back on what he did and maybe why he does some of the things the way that he does but mm-hmm. i don't know i mean it's a good mm-hmm. film i like it i'll have to rewatch it mm-hmm. Okay. And Paul? Um, <laughs> hmm. No, not really. All right. Um, well, uh, that's all we have time for this evening. Uh, thanks for listening. We should be back next week, I believe, with a conversation about animation. 